We were less than 200 feet away from the first victim a few minutes before she was murdered. We might even have heard the murderer's voice. And we haven't done a thing for the past week. You're the one not doing anything, Watson. For my part, I have been working. And, as you know, I've made good use of this week by tracking down and verifying all of the solid facts on these two murders to write up the notes that are on my desk. Read them over again and try to gain a bit of perspective.
I have read and reread them. But give me something to do then. A task where I can get stuck in, because... Find me a slaughterhouse that will give us exclusive use of its block for an hour. And find me... In your opinion, which common animal shares the most characteristics with humans from a physiological point of view? Uh, pig? I don't even know why I asked that question. Pray, find a dozen fresh pig's heads, Watson. Not big heads, I prefer small ones. Sows? That's it, Watson. As soon as you have done that, let me know. I request that you search in Whitechapel. Who knows, perhaps you will learn something about where Dr. Tumblety may be hiding. There is also no shortage of slaughterhouses and pig's heads in those parts. What a ridiculous idea to have asked Holmes for something to do. Where on earth am I going to find what he wants? Perhaps that kind Lucy will be able to help me. to ask. Good evening, Lucy. But is something wrong? Good evening, Dr. Watson. Yes, it's my uncle. He's no longer with us. Please accept my condolences, miss. Thank you, Doctor. But why are you here? Can I help you? My request may sound rather strange, but do you know if there is a butcher's or slaughterhouse in the area where pigs are killed? Uh, yes, Fletcher's the man. He was a regular client, owner of a little butcher's shop not far. But Miss Bella didn't want him to come, as long as he didn't treat his awful sickness. Can you point to his shop on my map? Certainly. Do you know anything about the two latest murders? Oh, goodness me, no. All the girls in the neighbourhood are terrified. Who will be next? That's what everyone is asking. Goodbye, Lucy. Until next time, perhaps, Doctor.
Ah, there's Fletcher's butcher shop. Closed due to illness. If the proprietor is ill, the butcher's block is probably not being used. Perhaps I can use it. Now, where could a sick butcher have got to? If the proprietor is ill, the butcher's block is probably not being used. Perhaps I can use it. Now, where could a sick butcher have got to? Yes, if Fletcher is ill, he should be here. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Dr. Gibbons. I have come to see you because I was wondering if, by any chance, you happen to have a patient by the name of Fletcher, a butcher who would have relinquished his shop due to illness. An illness caught during nocturnal encounters, if you catch my drift. Fletcher is one of the regulars at the clinic. Mercury treatment against syphilis. A night with Venus, a lifetime with Mercury. He left London a fortnight ago for the fresh country air. Why is he of interest to you? Oh, no reason. I'm more interested in using his shop, only for an hour or so. Would he have left his keys with family in the area? He has none left, but he must have left Hardiman, the cat's meat seller, to oversee his shop. They're in business. They're good friends. Do you know where he can be found? No, but wander around the neighbourhood and listen for his beep beeps. He often passes in front of the clinic. Besides... It's me that you're looking for, sweetheart. Um, actually, no. I am looking for the cat food seller, Hardiman. Hardiman? Poor Hardiman. It isn't quitting time for him yet. That gives me some time to wander the streets before he shows up and with him all the cats hereabouts. Do you know where he lives? Sure. And for a copper I might even tell you. Here are a few coins. You're too kind, Governor. Well, these days I knows that he lives with his mammy on Hanbury Street, in the same place where Dark Annie bled to death. Why did you call him poor Hardiman? Bah! He's in grieving, of course. Just a few weeks ago he lost his wife. And three months before that, his girl, poor fella. He was in tatters. Even came to cry on my shoulder, believe it or not. Well, I must leave you. I must go to Hanbury Street. This is the building in which poor Annie Chapman was killed. Baby! Are you Mr. Hardiman? That's me. I am Dr. Watson. I have come to see you about Fletcher's shop. I would like to use it for an hour or two, if you have the keys and your rates are reasonable. Do you want to operate on someone in the butchers? Not at all. One of my friends needs it to prepare pig's heads. Well, why not? Fletcher certainly wouldn't mind. But there's a problem. A problem? How so? This morning, the neighbour above broke his key in the door. The old boy must have already had a drink. So? Well, I tried my best to unjam it with Fletcher's spare key, which is pretty thin, and bam, 
That one broke too. Hard luck. But if you have the end of the broken key, perhaps it can be fixed. It must still be upstairs. I didn't pick it up. Fletcher has a key too, so I didn't think it was a problem. Fancy, if I just had another key with a simpler blade, I could copy it. I'm great at odd jobs. Fine, I will try to find all of that. Well, see you later then. Goodbye, sir. What a... Oh, how dreadful! Kebabs! The same as Hardiman's. So he prepares his meat here. My word! These are... innards! This bag contains butcher's equipment. This bag contains butcher's equipment. Where can I find a key with a simpler blade? On a worthless door, perhaps. I have nothing to ask. I have no reason to go that way. Have you found everything I need to remake the key? I have no reason to go that way. Why in the Lord's name would I go there? Why in the Lord's name would I go there?
This key was left inadvertently. Indeed, there is nothing terribly precious inside. But what a stench! Have you found everything I need to remake the key? There you go. I think you'll manage with all of this. I'm sure I will, sir. It won't take me long. Say, I think there's some of your business upstairs. Oh, you're right. I ain't had the time to sort it out. Sometimes I'm in such a hurry to prepare my meat that I forget to clean up. But why do it in the stairwell? Awful bleeds bucket loads, they do, as you've seen. Now why would I do that in my own lodgings? Ah, of course. But what about your poor neighbours? They owe it to me all the times I've helped them out. And I don't have a shop either. Say, you sell animal meat, isn't that right? Would you know where I could find a dozen small pig's heads? The guy who gets me my offal should have some. I'll pay your day's wages if you meet me at Fletcher's butcher shop in two hours with the pig's heads. Here's a little advance. I'll do my best, Doctor. The caretaker of another building told us that the place where your mother lives has a reputation for facilitating prostitutes' activities. Is that true? Sure, the doors are never closed. They come through here like it's Paddington Station. By the way, I heard about your loss. My condolences. Ta, sir. I saw them die slow deaths. My little girl, her face was eaten by the disease. <laughs> Thank you, my friend, and please forgive me for bringing up such painful memories. Go, I must do my rounds and I will look for what you've asked for. As for me, I will go and find Holmes, and we will go to the butchers together. Let's return to Fletcher's butcher shop. Your heads are on the block inside. Say, you wouldn't be the same chap who bought my whole load the other day. It's possible, but if you want to continue to do business together, you mustn't speak of my presence in the area to anyone. Don't worry, my lord. I'll be as quiet as a church mouse. Holmes, will you explain the reason and rhyme behind this masquerade? Elementary, we shall conduct an experiment that will allow us to answer a simple question. Does the type of weapon used by the killer correspond to a specific profession? And here are our sow's heads. Congratulations, Watson. You're welcome, Holmes, but what do you really want to do? Take up a collection? I need something. This wheel is broken and prevents the door from sliding. This wheel is broken and prevents the door from sliding. This wheel is broken and prevents the door from sliding. This wheel is broken and...
There is nothing further to find in this room, Watson. However, I need some knives. Our only hope is behind this door. There, this door is slightly raised. There is nothing further to find in this room, Watson. However, I need some knives. Our only hope is behind this door. This wheel is broken and... This wheel is broken and prevents the door from sliding. While I prepare our experiment, could you find me two knives? A small one, somewhat larger than a pocket knife, with a large, sharp blade. We'll need it to separate the bones and to cut through the thick skins. Then find me a long knife that's at least 13 inches long, no shorter, that's sharp and has a thick blade. Fine, Holmes, but I'd like to tell you about Hardiman. Do you know that he prepares his kebabs himself and... That he owns butcher's tools and uses offal? That's obvious, Watson. Pray, take my magnifying glass and my rule and get started, Watson. Find me these two knives. With the rule, I must find a large knife. Size, 13 inches. Size, 10 inches. Size, 11 inches. Thanks to the magnifying glass, I can find a small knife that matches Holmes's description. Fragments of cartilage. Fragments of cartilage. Hmm, large size. Fragments of cartilage. Fragments of cartilage. No, Holmes only needs two knives. Here are the knives you asked for. Be careful, they're awfully sharp. Holmes, I must say that this experiment is making me rather uneasy, comparing animal heads to these poor women. You're right, Watson, but this somewhat shocking experiment may help to end this massacre and save other victims. You can be sure of that. Look, these pigs' heads are still bloody, which will suit our experiment perfectly. I have a pocket knife and a scalpel with me. With the two knives you just brought me, we have a similar array of weapons as those probably used by the killer. We saw three types of throat wounds on the deceased attributed to this man, those intended to slit the throat, those intended to decapitate, and the more superficial yet mortal wound that led to the death of the unfortunate victim in Dutfield's yard, Miss Stride. With the help of these four knives, we are going to try to recreate these wounds on the pig's heads and see what we can establish about the weapon or weapons used. We may also be able to rule out Miss Stride as a victim of the killer of the other three.
Let's try to use these weapons on this head to obtain a large deep wound to the throat, like those that were noted on three of the four victims. This little knife is very sharp and has a very wide blade. This pocket knife is very sharp, but its blade is too thin. The wound is too shallow. Look, Watson, this knife easily penetrates the flesh. Let's try to decapitate our victim with these tools, knowing that the killer didn't quite manage to do it. Charming. This knife with a long blade easily slices the flesh, but cannot dislocate the vertebrae. With a scalpel, the wound is too shallow. The blade of this pocket knife is too thin to reach the vertebrae. Look, Watson, this little knife with a wide base can easily slice the vertebrae of our porcine friend. Let's try to use these weapons. Look, Watson, this knife easily penetrates the flesh. Elementary. Let's try to decapitate our victim with these tools, knowing that the killer didn't quite manage to do it. Charming. This knife with a long blade. The blade of this pocket knife is too thin to reach the vertebrae. Look, Watson, this little knife with a wide Let's see if these knives can inflict a mortal wound in a situation where a single quick blow is given. The scenario in question is that of Dutfield's yard. Look, Watson, the blade sinks easily into the flesh. In using the cutting edge of this pocket knife's blade, I can scrape the skin. This particularly sharp blade can make a deep gash with one quick slice. It cuts through the flesh easily as the blade is so sharp.
Let's try to decapitate our victim with these tools, knowing that the killer didn't quite manage to do it. Charming. This knife with a long blade easily slices the flesh, but cannot dislocate the vertebrae. With a scalpel, the wound is too shallow. The blade of this pocket knife is too thin to reach the vertebrae. Look, Watson, this little knife with a wide base can easily slice the vertebrae of our porcelain friend. This knife with a long blade. This knife with a long blade easily slices the flesh, but cannot dislocate the vertebrae. Look, Watson, this little knife with a wide base can easily slice the vertebrae of our porcelain friend. The blade of this pocket knife is too thin to reach the vertebrae. Look, Watson, this little knife with a wide base can easily slice the vertebrae of our porcelain friend. Let's see if these knives can inflict a mortal wound in a situation where a single quick blow is given. The scenario in question is that of Dutfield's yard. It cuts through the flesh easily as the blade is so sharp. This particularly sharp blade can make a deep gash with one quick slice. In using the cutting edge of this pocket knife's blade, I can scrape the skin. Look, Watson, the blade sinks easily into the flesh. Elementary. Let's try to decap charming.
This knife with a long blade easily slices the flesh but cannot dislocate the vertebrae. With a scalpel, the wound is too shallow. The blade of this pocket knife is too thin to reach the vertebrae. Look, Watson, this little knife with a wide base can easily slice the vertebrae of our porcine friend. Elementary. That's it, Watson, the big knife. With respect to the opinion of the medical examiners who noted that a butcher's knife with a long blade would have caused the eviscerations on some of the victims, we can assume, Watson, that he only used this type of weapon as it is capable of inflicting all of the wounds displayed. Furthermore, the Dutfield's Yard murder remains attributable, for the moment, to the Whitechapel killer, if we are able to explain why the murderer used his knife in a different manner. Why not go there now? We will try to reenact the killer's actions that night. Our first objective will be to clarify, one way or another, the statements of Constable Smith as well as this Hungarian by the name of Schwartz. We must also try to find out more about the International Working Men's Educational Club, underneath which the murder took place, perhaps at the Wasp's Nest. Yes, let's go to Dutfield's Yard or wherever, but quickly. I am in urgent need of fresh air. Let's go to the wasp's nest. Don't forget that Bluto may still be hiding here. I will try to find out more inside. You, Watson, must intercept the policeman on his rounds. Given the hour and a bit of luck, it will be Smith. Try to get some information from him. Understood, Holmes. Hello. I know you. You're Squibby's guardian angel. You weren't dressed the same last time, but I don't forget a face. No hard feelings, eh? 
Join me in a glass. Your Jack the Ripper is on everyone's lips and written in all of the papers. You must be awfully proud of yourself. You have skill, that's for certain. It's a shame you use it to mask rather than discover the truth. You better believe that I'm going to find out who it is. I got a hold of old Schwartz's interpreter. You know, the Hungarian who saw Liz Stride get it. Doesn't speak a word of English. And when he went round to the station, another Jew went along to interpret. I found that bloke, and he repeated everything that had been said at the station. It won't be long before I find these fellows. Why do you say these fellows? Were there several of them? Do you not read the papers or what? Well, given the rubbish that you read sometimes, let me explain. At 12.45 a.m., Schwartz goes down Burner Street towards Fairclough, on the side of the road where the workers' club is. A bit further from there, just near Dutfield Yard's wooden doors, a chap and a lady are arguing. The star said that the bloke wanted to push the girl into Dutfield's yard, but the translator told me that Schwartz saw him pulling her towards the road. She doesn't want to follow. He grabs her by the shoulders and throws her to the ground. She falls. Falls a bit, but not too loudly. Old Schwartz is scared, crosses to the other side but continues in the same direction. The bloke with the girl notices him and yells, Lipsky! At the same time, another bloke at the corner of Fairclough and Burner who was lighting his pipe gets in on the action. He starts coming towards Schwartz in a menacing way, and Schwartz takes to his heels, doesn't see anything else. Once he finds out that a woman got herself killed, he went to testify, and identified Longley's stride as the woman he saw getting thrown about. So there were definitely two blokes, mate. But why... why am I telling you all this? In Vino Veritas. I'll take my leave then, Mr. Bulling. That's right. Till next time. If you're looking for some company, Gov, you've come to the wrong place. Me? I'm just here to pour. I don't care who you is, I know nothing and I don't care neither. A draft, my good man. Here, sir. Tell me, was it not a mere stone throw away from here that the Whitechapel killer struck last week? That'd be Jack the Ripper, that's his name. Slit the throat of a working girl in a small courtyard over there behind them big wooden doors. Below the workers' club? The very spot, below Lipsky and Co. I wouldn't be surprised if Jack was one of them if you catch my drift. Lipsky and company. Do you mean to say that someone called Lipsky runs this club? Nah, it's just that it's full of Jews. In Whitechapel we call them all Lipskys, like that Lipsky who killed that girl in Batty Street last year. Oh, really? Last year a Jew named Israel Lipsky killed a lass who was six months pregnant by making her drink acid. One trial and one protest by rabbis later, and he was hanging. By those who don't much like him, the Jews are called Lipskis. Is the term Lipskis used to refer to the Jews in the area, and is this club frequented by Jews? You got it. Socialist Jews, even. They spend their evenings hollering, singing. I've seen them spitting on the bosses. And do you know the victim? No more her than any other. The working girls don't drum up business too much in this street. They need a reason to end up here. Very well. Goodbye. Cheers. First and foremost, I must find PC Smith. Good evening, Constable. Good evening, sir. I am Dr. Watson. Would you happen to be PC Smith, the man who patrols this beat? That's me. And you work with the famous Sherlock Holmes, don't you? What can I do for you? I believe you were on duty the night when the murder took place here. You would certainly be able to confirm a few details. 
such as the time of death that the medical examiner gave. It's just that I wasn't there when the body was discovered. I don't think I can help you. But I was told that you had seen the victim that very night. Indeed, but it was before the murder. I saw her, not far from here. She was talking to a man. It was around 12.30 or 12.35 a.m. What did this man look like? I only saw him from behind, really. He was wearing a short black outfit, a small felt hat like a cap in a dark colour, and a white collar. He seemed to be a respectable type. He was carrying a packet in his hand wrapped in newspaper, about 18 inches long and about 6 inches wide. His outfit reminds me of someone that I know. Was he a large man on the older side? I don't think so, no. Even though I only saw him from behind, I would say that he was barely 30 years old, or even less, say 28, or even less. 26 years old, and 5 foot 8 inches tall at the very most. He had a small dark brown moustache and an olive complexion, I would say, but once again, I only caught a brief glimpse of his face in three-quarter profile. Nobody else saw this man? I discussed this previously with Mr Eagle, the president of the workers' club. That night he returned around 12.40am to the club used the passage through Duckfield's yard to get into the club because the main door was locked. He can attest that he didn't see anyone else in the passage at that time, but wasn't really paying attention to who else might have been in Burner Street itself. He was listening to the song coming from the club. In short, no one else saw him. Well, thank you for having satisfied my curiosity, my friend. A fine evening to you, Doctor. Well, Watson, let's go to Dutfield's yard. Dutfield's yard. Your interrogation of P.C. Smith has proven to be very shrewd and of great interest. Thanks to the information I've managed to gather and that you were able to read in my notes in Baker Street, Watson, we can recreate what happened that fateful night at this location, Dutfield's Yards to be precise, the site of Listride's murder. Midnight, the socialist club meeting ends. The members, mainly Jewish men, gradually begin to leave the club in little groups or alone. Twelve twenty a.m. The American leaves the socialists club for some fresh air. The street is deserted. Twelve thirty to twelve thirty five AM Smith notices Liz Stride talking to the man with the package. Twelve forty AM Eagle, the president of the club, enters the workers' club via the passageway through Dutfield's yard. He passed through Dutfield's yard. If Liz Stride had already been killed, he would have had to walk over her. The murder, therefore, had not yet happened. 
12.43 a.m., Israel Sforz passes by Dutfield's yard and witnesses the attack on Liz Stride. Twelve forty four AM Schwartz crosses to the other side of the road. The attacker sees him and yells Lipsky. The attacker must have shouted to his accomplice at the end of the road, Lipsky, indicating at Schwartz using his head in an attempt to scare off this undesirable. At 12.45 a.m., Schwartz runs away, followed for a short distance by this man. At 1 a.m., Mr. Diemschutz wants to enter with his cars, but the pony refuses. We know that the murder took place between 12.45 and 1 a.m. Mr. Diemschutz, therefore, must have disturbed the killer. Let's place Liz Stride's murder on the timeline, Watson. Twelve forty five to one AM, the murder of Lestride. It took place in this very spot as the traces of blood were very confined. We will come back to this point in a few moments to elaborate on what could have happened. Well, we are still missing certain information in order to finish this investigation, Watson. This door leads to the club for Jewish socialist workers. Watson, imagine the victim laid down there on the ground. her right hand, it is bloody as is her wrist. The throat, there is but one clean cut, slightly slanted downwards. Her left hand, it is closed around a bag of pastels. Her knees and dress, they are clean. The ground is muddy.
We have two possibilities. The first is that Liz Stride's killer and the attacker, seen by Schwartz, were one and the same man. The second is that Liz Stride meets a client. After some discussion, they head towards Dutfield's yard to do their business. As soon as they arrive, the attacker appears while his accomplice keeps watch. Schwartz's arrival dissuades the two men from lingering. They leave the area and leave Liz Stride in a tense state, but glad to have kept her client. He will be her murderer. Both hypotheses are possible, but an incongruous detail will serve to corroborate one of them. An incongruous detail that we were able to establish regarding the Hanbury Street murder. Which one would that be, Watson? Look at the victim carefully, Watson, and tell me the link between the murder of Liz Stride and those of Nichols and Chapman. No, that's not it. The bag of pastels, Holmes. The bag of pastels, indeed, Watson. If this woman had to defend herself against an attacker, why would she have held onto this bag in her hand? It didn't fall because this woman's hand tensed at the moment when she fell to the ground. Therefore, Watson, we know the killer distracted his victim's attention by making them take something out of their pockets. Why didn't he slit her throat like the others? He must have feared a struggle with this strong-willed woman. Why didn't he eviscerate her? Because Louis Diemschutz arrived. Do you think the Whitechapel killer is behind this murder, Holmes? Yes, and now this murder has been linked to its rightful perpetrator, it will take on deeper meaning when we have examined the facts from that night. Let's go to Mitre Square, where Catherine Eddowes was killed. And make haste, Watson, as we have another murder to commit in 40 minutes. Here we are, Watson, Mitre Square. It took us a mere 20 minutes to get here. If the killer left Dutfield's yard around 1 o'clock, as we assume, he would have arrived here at around 1.20 a.m. We know that Catherine Eddow's body was discovered at 1.44 a.m. Catherine was released from prison around 1 o'clock, but we have no information as to what she could have been doing until her death. This place has three possible ways out. Let's see where they lead. As a precaution, I brought an old map of the area with me. It will help us get our bearings. Let's hurry, Holmes. This neighbourhood makes me ill at ease. Watson, we are now in the exact spot where poor Eddowes tragically ended her days. This spot is very dark, Holmes. That is probably why our murderer chose it. Let's see, we'll need a lantern. Now then, we will need a lantern. This is Mitre Street, from where Watkins, the constable who found the body, came. I have no reason to go that way. This is Mitre Street, from where Watkins, the constable who found the body, came. This dark and narrow passage leads to St. James's Place. I have no reason to go that way. Church Passage. It must be opposite the Imperial Club at 16 to 17 Duke Street. Let's...
Hello, you must be Abraham Solomonovich, am I right? Yes, that's me. But I know you. You brought a lad to my place to take care of a cat, and I loaned you my mask. That's me. May I present? Dr. Watson, of course. Delighted. And you? I have known for a few days that you are a detective by the name of Sherlock Holmes. Is that so? You don't miss a thing, do you? It was the children who gave me away, am I right? Uh, they didn't want to, but I gained their confidence by offering them a small comb and half a cake. They made a good deal out of it, so I don't blame them. However, I must request, as a personal favor, that you do not reveal my identity. You have my word. Curiosity is just killing me, as you may have guessed. Would it be breaking an oath to confide in me the nature of the investigation that you are leading? Does this spot where we are now in Mitre Square mean anything to you? A demon lives in this city, Mr. Holmes. These unmentionable acts degrade the human race and put the Jewish community in terrible danger. Lots of rumors are circulating, but they are but rumors. I see you're leaving the Imperial Club. It's a stone's throw away from Mitre Square, and the two recent murders were most probably discussed in there. Do you know if anyone from the club saw or heard anything that night? Yes, Mr. Holmes. That night, three members of our club saw a woman talking to a man at the very spot where we are standing. A few minutes before the body was found, at the end of this passage. Fantastic, Holmes. Calm yourself, Watson. There is nothing at the moment to suggest it was the victim. Uh, can we meet these members? I am afraid that won't be possible. As soon as the police heard the evidence of these men, they were sworn to silence. I understand. But you are working for the good, and I must tell you what I know. One of the three men, my friend Joseph, left that night with two other members of the Imperial Club, Harry and another Joseph. It was around 1.35 a.m., perhaps a bit earlier, when Joseph, uh, not my friend, but the other, the Aldgate Butcher, exited. He saw a man and a woman in discussion at this very spot where we are. These men must have been about 16 feet away from the couple. That's about right. So Joseph, the butcher, said to the other two, while pointing at the couple, Look, I don't like going home alone when I see this kind of people here. My friend Joseph looked at them without noticing anything strange and didn't understand what he meant. They had the look of two rather unkempt people, but no more than that. After the murder, did these three men tell the police what they had seen? Not quite. Harry stated that he hadn't seen the couple. As for Joseph, the butcher, even though he was the one who commented on them and pointed them out, said that he couldn't remember anything except that the man was about three inches taller than the woman, who was five feet tall, no more. My friend Joseph, on the other hand, did his best to cooperate with the police. And what did your friend Joseph say? What did this man and woman look like? The man must have been 30 years old, about five foot seven inches, light complexion, and a fair moustache. He wore a loose, dark jacket, a grey cap, and a red scarf around his neck. But he said that he only saw him for a brief instant, and it would be impossible to recognize him. And the woman? He only saw her from behind. She had her hand on the man's stomach and seemed to be pushing him. He said that he remembered that she was small, 
was wearing a black jacket and a black bonnet. After his testimony, the police took him to see the clothing of the deceased and Joseph said that they looked identical to those of the woman he had seen. Like I already said, he only glanced at the two as he was headed with the others in the direction of Oldgate. One final question. The Imperial Club is a Jewish club, isn't that correct? Indeed. Thank you for your help, Mr. Solomonovich. Bah, it was nothing. We must, at all cost, prevent this demon from striking again. And the police seem to have some difficulty in doing that. I wish you the best of luck, Mr. Holmes. I need something. The Imperial Club. I have no reason to go that way. Nothing of interest here. This building is the Great Synagogue of London. Closed. Now then, we will need a lantern. Now then, we will need a lantern. Now then, we will need a lantern. The lantern, Watson. A thimble is located right beside one of the victim's hands, just like Chapman's sachet of pills and Stride's pastels. Do these objects spread out by the victim remind us of anything, Watson? The inside of the thighs is clean. Uh, once again, there were no sexual relations between the victim and her murderer. Part of this apron is missing. We will follow up on that shortly. The main incision goes from the sternum all the way down to the groin. The murderer opened this abdomen as if it were an animal carcass. A kidney was removed. The uterus was removed. These intestines were pulled out altogether to grant access to the abdomen. The head is turned towards the left. The murderer must have been on the right side of his victim. Let's look at her from the front. The eyelids were cut off. The nose was cut. There is but one wound, Watson. It goes from the left side and descends in a slight oblique towards the right side.
There is but one wound, Watson. The eyelids were cut off. These intestines were pulled out altogether. The head is turned towards the left. The murderer must have been on the right side. The cheeks were slashed to make them thinner. My goodness, Holmes, it was a slaughter. Understand, Watson, that our killer had neither the time nor the conditions to bother with the niceties. He had no more than seven or eight minutes at most to kill the woman, open her up, and all the while in total darkness. Holmes, it's a woman, a poor victim you're talking about. Consider all the time this man lost and the risks that he actually took by cutting the victim's face and the lower abdomen in around 20 precise spots, especially the lungs and the liver. These attacks, which I considered gratuitous, are, in fact, nothing of the sort, and have as much sense as the removal of the organs. Watson, we must now consult our timeline. We began in Dutfield's yard, but this time we will try to recreate the actions of certain people. In this case, those of the two policemen. On 30 a.m., PC Watkins didn't see the corpse while on his rounds. If PC Watkins did his rounds properly, and there is no reason to doubt this was the case, as he discovered the corpse a quarter of an hour later, the murder hadn't yet taken place, and there was no one in Mitre Square, unless they were hidden among the shadows. Enter Mitre Square via Mitre Street, Watson, and stop and try to see me with the lantern. I will be where poor Edow's corpse was. I have no reason to go that way. I have no reason to go that way. I see you, Holmes. Perfect, Watson. Let's look at our timeline, Watson. Very good, Watson. Thus, we can categorically state that the murder had not yet occurred at half one. One thirty-five a.m. A man and a woman are arguing at the entrance of Church Passage. The man came from Aldgate. One forty-two a.m. P.C. Harvey arrives in Mitre Square. 
It should be noted, Watson, that the constable didn't enter Mitre Square. He could not have seen the corpse lying on the ground. But would he have been able to see a man sitting or standing? Go to the church passage entrance, then come back and try to see me while holding your lantern. I will stay at the spot where the victim was discovered. I have no reason to go that way. I see you, Holmes. You had to proceed into the square in order to see me, something Harvey didn't do. It is possible that the killer was still there. 1.42 a.m. PC Harvey arrives at Mitre Square, but does not go in. The murderer may well have still been there. One forty-four a.m. The body is discovered. Let's put the murder of poor Eddowes on the timeline, Watson. One thirty-five and one forty-two a.m. The murder would appear to have taken place between these times. That is to say, within seven minutes. Agreed, Holmes. But does this really prove that our killer had the time to perpetrate these two murders? Let's look at our timeline, Watson. There, Watson, we are now certain that the murderer really had the time to commit these two murders. Incredible! Let's look at our deduction board, Watson.
This spot is making me nauseous. Can we not head back, Holmes? We certainly can't, Watson. We have one final point to address. Do you remember the piece of white apron that was missing just now? It was found just a few steps away from here, at the entrance of a building. That's where we must go. Let's go. There's the spot, Watson. By night, Goulston Street is deathly silent, which will permit us to carry out a fair few experiments. Let's find the entrance where the piece of the victim's apron and the mysterious chalk message were found. Look at these signs, Watson. We are in the Jewish High Street. I have no reason to go that way. I have no reason to go that way. Look at these signs, Watson. We are in the Jewish High Street. There's the spot where the apron and the message were found by PC Long. Now, let's recreate the scene. Remember, Watson, it was raining that night. Find me something with which to mimic raindrops hitting this wall while I write something with my chalk. The Jews are not the men that will be blamed for nothing. But what does it mean? Have you found something for us to pour water from, Watson? Find a container and some water. Let me remind you that it's night time and the street is deserted, Holmes. A watering can. That's what I need. But I can't reach it. That may come in handy. Who knows? Water. The Jews are not the men that will be blamed for nothing. But what does it mean? I have no reason to go that way. An old wooden pole. A merchant probably threw it out. I have no reason to go that way.
That may come in handy. Who knows? Have you found something for us to pour water from, Watson? Yes, I have, Holmes. If this message were written by the killer, then it would have been lying in this entrance for up to 35 minutes before being discovered. Let's find out in what state it must have been. This message could not have withstood an entire night in the rain. During the investigations carried out on the night of the double murder, PC Hulse inspected the entrances of this street around 2.20 a.m. and confirmed to have seen nothing out of the ordinary. At 2.55 a.m., 35 minutes later, P.C. Long found Catherine Eddow's piece of apron and the message in chalk. This message would not have withstood a whole night in the rain, as had I continued to water it for a little longer, I would certainly have erased it. It was written, therefore, at the moment when the piece of apron was dumped. This substantiates P.C. Hulse's statement, which stated he had seen neither of these during his rounds. After its discovery, it was guarded and protected from the rain which was subsiding, which explains why it was still legible when it was erased at half five. My dear Watson, when you met P.C. Smith on his rounds in the street, where was he? On the pavement or in the middle of the road? In the middle of the road, Holmes, without a shadow of a doubt. Good. You will go down the street with your lantern as if you were a policeman on patrol, using Smith's position as a guide. As soon as you see the entrance where I use the watering can, tell me if you see anything. I have no reason to go that way. There, Holmes. From here, I can see something written. Can you read it? No. Do you see the white rag, Watson? I see something on the ground, but I'm not sure if it's what you were talking about. P.C. Long, who found the piece of apron, was examining the interior of the entrances, and yet nobody would have predicted that this piece of material would be discovered on the very night of the murder by a policeman on patrol. What are you trying to get at, Holmes? Let's look at this message on the wall, Watson. The Jews are not the men that will be blamed for nothing. In other words, the Jews were possibly blamed for nothing, but that will no longer be the case. Reading this message naturally begs one question. What would that be, Watson? Why? Indeed, Watson, why? For what reason would one have the right to blame the Jews in the future? Remember, Liz Stride was killed near a club for socialist Jews, Eddowes not far from the synagogue and the Imperial Club, and finally, this piece of apron dropped here. This building is occupied by Jewish families. The killer really did go out of his way to incriminate the Jews living in the area. It's a bit obvious, Holmes. Yes, but with the rumours, Watson, the author of this message would have received a response to his strategy. You are right, Holmes. So perhaps it's a good thing this message was erased. Whoever took the decision to do this is a man of great wisdom and courage. Let's return to Baker Street, Watson. I have some pipes to smoke to help me think more clearly. Let's go back to Baker Street. Home, sweet home. <laughs> 